What's up, what's up, everybody? It's your man, DVS and my coming to you on another DVS Friday. What's up? We have made it here to another Friday, and I am really, really excited. This weekend, we have so much going on. We're going to start, to, well, actually, this whole month. First of all, um, everybody knows that this is Black History Month. So um, let me uh, hit y'all to something real quick. There are going to be special airings uh, tonight on Roots NYC on WBLS if you are in the tri-state area in New York City. Uh, 107.5 that is WBLS in, in, in Newark. Um, who, who is that? I don't, I don't I can't see it. But anyway, um, so yeah, so you might want to check that out. And also, uh, Club Elevation, of course you know how to do Club Elevation. Tonight, I believe there's a party, but tomorrow night is my, not my party, but the party where I will be hosting with DJ Punch up at Club Elevation at 1425 Springfield Avenue, Irvington, New Jersey. The party starts at party time, and we are going to have a good time. Uh, you do want to get there early because parking is at a minimum. And, you know, you want to get there and reserve your spot so that when the party's over, you can get right in your whip and, you know, make it on home. But, uh, and next Saturday is humble beginnings let's get ready to humble y'all know how we do and it is the 12th anniversary happy anniversary to my humble beginnings family 12 years 140 we have been having a wonderful time these 12 years you know what i mean it's just been such a beautiful day so down the and we're gonna continue to do it as much as we can possibly as much as we possibly can so if you are not doing anything next saturday Come get ready to humble with us. You know what I mean? And even if you are doing something, put that off till Sunday and come to humble. Okay? Um, just uh, um, all you guys, I want to say uh, thank you for tuning in. And again, I'm, I'm going to say I hope to, because y'all need my phone. I don't know if you're jealous of what I do here. I don't know. But, you know, but I'm gonna try, again, I'm going to try to keep the stream going. And I'm going to introduce my guest right now uh I, I this is a man who really needs no introduction um so we're gonna sit here and we're gonna have a conversation ladies and gentlemen mr kevin hedge you know i can't remember right now that's uh, you said <laughs> What's going on, Cam? You know, you know, man, it's cold. Yeah. Um, and I'm just impressed by this whole place that you run. This, uh, what, now you said it was like a community center. What yes, is the it's name? called The Hub. The Hub. Yeah, help this, us be better. Help us be better. Become better. All right, yeah, help, help us. Be, this is really amazing. And you see all of the, 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 the album covers, the uh -huh. holiday all of the older album covers from, you know, when, when everything in the world was good. When we were having fun. <laughs> well, we are still having fun. We are, but we but have fewer uh, bills and less cares. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> but what's really the most thing is that this place, when explaining and walking through it and feeling an energy, mm -hmm. I'm definitely new. This, yeah. is, this is really beautiful. This is what happens when somebody actually believes in something. This is the result of belief. I mean, it's just beautiful to know that this gentleman has donated his time, his life, mm -hmm. to making a place for young people to better themselves. Absolutely. This is great. And, you know, people, you guys who have been watching the show know that every time I, every time I get an opportunity 
I talk about this place and I'm hoping that there are people who know other people who might have the resources to turn this into a, a better place for the young people in this neighborhood. There are no more boys and girls clubs in this city. We don't have that luxury anymore. Um, everybody's trying to be independent, meaning that like, there's no franchise situation that's reputable, but we need to start somewhere. And this is one of the best places that I believe we can start. I, I know this place, I've worked with this place on different levels. So um, if you like it, you know, the one thing I'm trying to get done here is if you're an organization Oh, I keep taking the microphone away from my mouth. My apologies. Panasonic has moved into the city in Newark. We have Prudential here. And, you know, a few other big companies. And I'm hoping that we can get somebody from their uh, community relations department to hopefully see, come down here and see that this is a worthwhile venture. Okay, that was my soapbox two seconds. So, but what's interesting is that, understand, we talk about this. What is interesting is that we're talking about Panasonic and big companies. Yes. How about us? How about us? Yes. Mm -hmm. How about us taking dollars mm -hmm. and putting them together so that, you know, Panasonic, that's great. But we have to do for us, too. That's good, absolutely. Right. What about these churches that are in the world? Who's appealing to some of these churches that's collecting millions of dollars? out of here every year mm -hmm. what about those people who who are supposed to care like in the church mm -hmm. and other places and you know obviously i'm sure that he's involved with some uh, community leaders as far as politicians in newark but i think sometimes when we keep running the panel because everybody's running the panel Everybody's running to Audible.com. Everybody's running to Prudential. Everybody's knocking on their door. Mm -hmm. And I believe, what I mean by everybody is most people when they're looking for this, guys, the they time. think yeah. the big fish. Mm -hmm. But I think at some point we have to get the word out about a place like this. And so that we can support us. And Absolutely. there's enough people and in and around Newark that have you know, need big resources. But churches don't collect big resources. Churches make their money twenty dollars at a time, ten dollars at a time. Right. And and in Newark there's a lot of churches and I'm I'm sure if we really added up all the income that the churches collect over the year, just over a year in Newark, mm -hmm. it'd be maybe in a hundred million dollar range. Oh. Probably more. So if we can get a church that, that all of these churches are collecting a hundred million dollars or better, if they can do two percent mm -hmm. to a place like that, that would just like this into something fantastic. I'm sorry. Absolutely. I'm on my soapbox. No, 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 no. <laughs> because you know what? And I've asked there was a there was an idea that I had. As opposed to asking people for money. At mm -hmm. one point I was just asking people to donate an hour of their time a week. If you get 10 people to donate an hour of their time a week, do you know what we could get accomplished? See, I wouldn't know that. Situations like this, well, we don't know it until we do it. Right. That's the whole thing. We but don't know it until we do it. what is the necessary resource that's needed for something like this to really grow and be even more effective than it is? I don't know. Uh, Shahir Williams says, small business here are donating to all of these political events and so on, but are willing to donate to this. I guess you could say aren't willing to donate to this. But if we are not there, they don't think about it. So I think we have to be more in their faces, I guess. Well, right. Shahir has been a small businessman for a long time, and Shahir is one of the many young businessmen in and around the city who is progressive in his thinking. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's somebody we can recruit said we yeah. <laughs> now, I just said we maybe somebody that can be recruited to help and he, you can bring Shy here because he's got vision mm -hmm. to a place like this and see what's going on and then maybe him and his team can start to spread the word and come together and, and, and it doesn't have to be something a ridiculous amount of 
money that has to be. Because right now you're making it with nothing. Mm -hmm. So imagine if we can get 10 businesses together that would donate $50 a month. That's $500 a month. In a year, that's $6,000. So if we get 10, and we get 20, that's yeah, 12,000. Mm -hmm. But this is the way things can go. Money is made, I believe, by stacking. That's the way you gotta build it. You gotta put $1 on top of the other dollar. And then it goes from there. So Shahir is definitely someone who I'm, I admire as a young businessman. Always been an entrepreneur in his spirit. So maybe he's a guy that can be recruited. Oh, Kenny Bobian said he's been trying to reach you forever. Reach who? You. I'm the easiest person to reach. Okay, Kenny, you heard that? Kenny knows that. <laughs> Kenny knows that. Kenny's been to my house. Kenny's one of the few people that has been to my house. Okay, so Kenny, you know, you know now how to get him. Um, so, okay, I guess maybe we should try to do it. We are. <laughs> I mean, this place is important. So it, is, really it, it really and is. And I'm moved. So this is important. Oh, yeah, and we're doing a Super Bowl party on Sunday. And if the Super Bowl party is to raise funds for the 15 families in North that were displaced by the fire. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right, so here, I'll reach out to you. I'll you up through Facebook. And the number to call in 973 900 If you have any questions or you want to uh, send a shout out to Kevin Hedge, um, a lot of people know you. A lot of people know you from the radio. I don't know if it'll see if you can, if it, if it will. We on the radio now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of people know you from, you can put it, yeah, turn it down. Yeah, that way. Just. A lot of people know you from the radio, they know you from the shelter, they know you from all of that. Um, there's other stuff that you've done that people aren't familiar with. Now you're going to have me think? Yes. Oh, oh, actually, I'll, 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 uh, I'll, 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 I'll help you. I'll, I'll push the direction. Okay. Bring in the noise. Yeah, he was producing on that years ago. And what uh, made you want to get into theater? Seeing young men trying to do something, you know, watching, not so much Savion, but the gentleman who was playing a bucket drum, that was impressive to me, yeah. to be able to say, we can make music from our soul, and it starts with whatever we have. That's what made me, drew me to that. And then, I was lucky, I was in the position to have some resources enough to invest when they were at Joe's Pub, see, that's how I started. Oh, wow. Down, well, Joe's Pub was a part of the public theater. And when the noise funk started in the public theater, with George Wood. so that was at the small time. Everybody knows when they got to Broadway. However, there was a time before Broadway when it was just started. And that was the time to get in when you could when they when they were like a place like this they needed money mm -hmm. and you jump in and you you give whatever you can give to keep it going because young black men are involved and you want to keep their dream alive if you can and I was young and black and had dreams and uh, know what that feels like mm -hmm. so you want to help as much as you can and that, and who knows that helping turns into success and then the success turns into notoriety and publicity and, and fame and then sometimes it turns into earnings. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is before Facebook. This is before, oh wow. You, now you say that to say all of this noise punk stuff was way before the internet was what it is today. Mm -hmm. um, so we were true grassroots back then. It was all about pooling together us mm -hmm. and energies. That's where it all started. You, you, you know, nowadays, when you talk about everything, nowadays, you guys, oh, a lot of, 
Bible says you guys, the millennials, they have a different view than we have had back when we were trying to make things work for us on the artistic side. Mm -hmm. We had to grind. Yes. We had to grind in a different way. Now, I'm not saying they're not grinding now, but the grind back then mm -hmm. was good. It was definitely good. Um, what else you want to <laughs> Embarrassing. That, oh, man. Now you're going to make me feel bad. Um, what's the... Let me just, for those of you who may or may not know, everything, you, you've worked in the music business for a long time, you have been on clubs, you still play today at Roots NYC, uh, CLO, the party is Roots NYC in New York. Of coming through all of that, through all of that business, and you've been doing this for how long? Over 30 years. Over 30 years. What is... Cause I and this is this is the part that I told you that we were going to talk about. Okay. Um, what is your focus now at this point in your life? I mean, it, it like you know when you ask me that, and, and you've had the opportunity to get to know me as a brother. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to say to you is no surprise. My focus right now is 100 percent. A gentleman named Ethan Hunt. That's my focus. Um, that's what I get up every day and focus on. That gentleman. So, now if you're talking business wise, my focus, DBS is interesting. I was talking to, um, <laughs> I was talking to a friend of mine on the way up. I don't know if I really have an interest right now in, in business at the same level that I used to. Um, if Barbara is still on, Barbara is a very good friend, close to me. And Barbara and I wanted to work together before my son was born and after my son was born. And unfortunately for Barbara, she met me at a time when I was kind of in a place that I had... Uh, almost lost interest in um, nobody's never heard me say this in the business I lost interest in it uh, all I ever wanted to do was to be in a way like Larry the Bay. that's all I ever wanted to do with this thing and then uh, so everything else is a byproduct of that dream to be like Larry the Van. and that's really just to be a DJ uh, and have fun at do things like and then it veered off into record production and different things like that and uh, but one night I was standing in the club and I'm behind the turntables and a good friend of mine was standing next to me and I looked at him and I said wow all I wanted to do was be like like that and I'm playing the records in the big club and the club is dancing and having a good time and I'm like this is it this is all I wanted to do so as time went on things started to change in the music business the music business started to contract because of um, you know technology started to take over mm -hmm. and I, I'm from the old school like we talked about technology a little bit how the millennials have it a little easier what I mean by grind is going back and Barbara was around and those things when we wanted to give a party and have a party, we had to sit down and stamp and label all of the flyers. You had to design a flyer, you had to make it, you get it printed. Then somebody had to go pick the flyers up. You had to put them in the back of your car. You had to bring them to where you had to put the labels on them so you could mail them to people's houses. Mm -hmm. Now, when we first started working at Shelter, we had 17,000 names that flyers had to go out to 17,000 people. That meant 17,000 labels had to go through. That meant you had to have a team of people that sat around and did this on a regular basis, and it would take days to do one mail. Then when you got the mailing prepared, you box it all up, and, what's up, bro? And once you box it all up, you'd have to take it to the post office to bulk mail. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we were working in New York. 
And if anybody knows the post office in New York, right behind Madison Square Garden, mm -hmm. with all those steps, mm -hmm. all of those probably 20 boxes had to go up those steps wow. and had to be carried. And I was the guy that did that. See, back then, you had two deep bodies like that. You had to stand out in front of clubs and pass out flyers mm -hmm. in 27 degree weather. You had to go to clubs and put flyers on cars in 15 degree weather because that's what you needed to do to make it happen. Nowadays, you guys are just <laughs> Facebooking in the warmth of your house <laughs> when we were out there grinding. But having said that, uh, being that the times are a little easier to throw parties as far as getting the word out, mm -hmm. those times were a lot of fun. I remember doing those mailings at Shelter. Babs can attest to this. So we just buy 10 pieces. And we'd have everybody in the on the middle of the dance floor labeling mail wow. so that we could mail it out to have people to come to those parties. Uh, but that was going back to 1990, 1991. And then time moved on. And then by the time I got to what we usually call Shelter 103 on 39th Street, that's the first time we started email. And using that as a tool to get the word out. But, uh, so what I'm interested in now is I really don't know. I'm still interested in the things that I do. I, I love what I do. It is my passion. I love creating music. I love the business of music. I love booking the artist. I love being the artist. I love booking the DJ. I love being the DJ. I love throwing the party. I love facilitating the party i love owning the club i love every aspect of it with every soul of my body but it's something that i'm completely interested in right now no i don't know what that would be i, I haven't found it yet. okay i'm still searching for it. uh two things first uh you said that you wanted to be like larry levin how yeah. close do you think in your life have you come to getting to that. Never. Never? Never. Uh, why do you say never? Uh, Harry is God DJ. Yeah. A DJ God. Mm -hmm. so never. You can't, can't get close to God. That's never. Uh, the things that impressed me about Larry was his artistry. Um, his ability to maintain that artistry through the business of it all. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, I, what I learned from Larry was the art of being a DJ. You know, what I mean by the art of being a DJ is wanting to play music that moves people. That's what he wanted to do. And this is a direct conversation with him. Um, had the good fortune of meeting Larry a few times. But in a conversation with him at a Glenn Guthrie session, he said that's what he wanted to do, just play records that move people. And, and the other part that was different for me, what I did learn from Larry was that instead of just being the DJ at the club, I wanted to make sure that I owned the club. Mm -hmm. um, in my life, I never, you know, I think Derek Jeter is great. Uh, Derek Jeter is the superstar, and everybody knows Derek Jeter, but I always wanted to be George Steinberg, because that's the guy. If you could pay Derek Jeter $30 million a year, that's the guy I want to be. Right. <laughs> the guy that's paying. I want to be Robert Kraft, that's paying Tom Brady. I love Tom Brady, but I, I think I'd rather be Robert Kraft. I've always loved the back. This is the most out front I've ever been in my entire career. Um, and I'm enjoying this too, but being in the back and being able to see things grow and develop in this is special. And especially when nobody knows you have any business I love that the most. Speaking of Washington as well, uh, Ethan, who I've had the pleasure of meeting, he's such a nice 
Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I haven't had, I guess I haven't been in your you position at all. <laughs> First, let's start. Uh, what what made you want to become? Why why didn't you become a dad earlier? Because of my music career. Okay. Because I felt like it. This is really how I felt. Um, first of all, I didn't really know my father when I was born. Mm-hmm. So that wasn't important to me. What was important was how my mother made me. And when I know that when I was born, I became my mother's life. That's what her life was dedicated to. Doing the best she could. And I felt like if I was to ever have a child, that I wanted to be that dedicated to the child. Uh, but I wanted to do it on my terms. So, being that I had wanted to do this music career, I knew that there was no way that I could have this music career and invest time and effort in it like I wanted to. And invest time and effort into a child like I wanted to. It would have been virtually impossible to have both of them be equally invested. You gotta do one or the other. That's the way I felt all my life. So that's what I did. I wanted to invest my music career and all my time into my music and business career. And then this happened, and uh, basically, I, I basically almost quit the music business just to be with him every day. And, and that's what I do. I'm with him every day. You know, should be telling me that I'm with him every day. I love it. I can't even imagine not doing without him. You know, it's interesting uh, when Arsenio Hall decided to come back to TV. Mm-hmm. He did an interview with Oprah Winfrey. If anybody go to YouTube, you can probably see that interview. That is how I felt, how he feels. It is something that I always believe in, that if you have a child, then your life becomes your child's life. And uh, I have, in my life, made sacrifices to do what I wanted to do in life. Mm-hmm. And that was to be the music person and the business man that I wanted. With that being said, when it came time for this, it seemed like God was telling me that you need to do this. And, uh, and then he gave me somebody that was really special. He gave Ethan something special that needed my full attention. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's an honor to be with that. It really is. It's an honor to be with that. Now, what's the biggest lesson you've learned from the dad? Oh. You know, I learned what the word love really means. Mm. Before that, I'm going to say this, and I'm sorry to say this. I've probably used that word so many times. Mm. I love you, I love you, I love you. I, I know people are thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've used that word a lot of times. But um, when I look at him, I know what the definition of the word is. Mm. You know, you always... What does love mean? What does that word mean? What is it, a feeling, an emotion? But now I know what the true definition is. I can't live without the person. That's what it is. I can't live without him. That's it. I need him. And that's what it is. I need him. More than he needs me. So, so I learned that. What the, and so now when I use the word love, I use it, and if I tell you I love you, and I tell everybody this, who I love to, if I tell you I love you, I know what it means. Mm. So I don't come from the right place. Because I've said that word so many times over my life. And said it, you think you mean it. Yeah, yeah. You think you want to say it. Uh, sometimes you say it just to get somebody to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but... When he was born, and I really recognized this is what this word means. This is what it means to love somebody. It's that unconditional feeling of like, no matter what they do, you can't live without them. You can't be without them. It's air. 
You know, that's what I learned. That's the biggest lesson. I okay. Uh, just for what? What do you want to do next in your career? Because you've just about done everything. You've done, like you said, you've owned the club, you DJ in the club, wrote the songs, produced the songs, put out the songs. Like you've done. Yeah, did Broadway. Broadway, just about everything. Produce that there is. To do. Produce shows and turns on Broadway. Mm-hmm. Um, real estate we've done over the years. You know that I'm proud of. Mm-hmm. All the businesses that I've done, everybody I've worked with, I'm proud of the situation. Um, when when I first started out and I worked uh, with Blaze, we were very successful. Mm-hmm. We did well. Um, I'm proud of that. Then I worked with uh, Timmy. We were successful. Mm-hmm. I'm really proud of that. Uh, I worked with Louie over these past few years, and we've been successful. I'm proud of that. Uh, other record labels, with when I was working with West End, we bought West End in 2002. Mm-hmm. We got out of it in 07. We took it from dormant to its selling for a substantial amount of money. I'm real proud of that. Uh, so, yeah, I'm proud of the business successes we had. I'm proud of the failures, business failures we had. What do you mean? Well, you know, some of the things didn't work out. I had a limousine company that didn't work out too well. <laughs> <laughs> it did work out too well. Uh, and through no fault of my own, it's just it was my fault because I didn't have the right thing. So, yeah, we invested a lot of money in that. It didn't work out. But uh, certain things I had, uh, you know, years ago I bought Moving Records. We had a legendary Moving Records that was on Central Avenue. And I was going to move it to another site on Central Avenue. And we were trying to open it. And by the time I got ready to open it, uh, it wasn't me for the right. So that didn't work out. So well. But you know, for the most part, I'm, I'm happy with the level of success we had with business and all. Yeah, it's been real, it's been a lot of fun. So is there something that you want to do now? That's- I don't know what I want to do now. We talked about that earlier. Yeah. I have no idea what I want to do. I want to see people happy. That's really what I want to do. Like I get the most joy now out of seeing people that were around me for lack of a better understanding or better words that I had some idea or some help in mentoring I get a, a lot of joy out of seeing them successful I think I get more joy out of seeing them successful than seeing me especially now um, when I see what Jihad is doing somebody I had a chance to know when he was young and mentor him to some degree when I see what the love is doing, I had a chance to work with him and see him mentor him to some degree. Uh, that would go you know, extend on to Ian Friday or or even Vincent Herbert for that matter. Uh, most people don't know exactly who Vincent is. Vincent is is Tamar and Ben, Tamar Braxton's husband. Uh, and actually Vince we we found Lady Gaga. Yeah, a lot of people, I don't talk about it, but Vince was, he actually found Lady Gaga. She recorded a little bit with us. So we've been lucky that way. So yeah, I know it's people think, yeah, it was some publishing involved, not a lot. <laughs> not a lot. And uh, you know what inspires me now? When I watch The Defiant Ones, that's a documentary on Dr. Dre. On HBO, that is inspired. Uh, when I see Dr. Dre get a check for a billion dollars, doing what he loves, I want to get us a billion dollar check. If I can get a billion dollar check. We can do some wonderful things with a place like this. So that's what inspires me. Um, that's what inspires me. So how will I get that billion dollar check? 
I don't know what kind of work I want to do. And that's the problem. I haven't set my heart on any work. But uh, I would like to I would like to be able to do that. Interesting. A lot of people think, well, I don't know what a lot of people think, to be honest with you, because we use that word. A lot of everybody's saying this. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily true. What happened was about, I'd say, 06, 07, I was trying to do an online internet portal. At the time, we were a little bit ahead of our time, because originally I was selling downloads at WestEndRecords.com. People don't know that. I was before tracks. We were selling uh, westendrecords.com. After TrackSource got started, I couldn't compete with Brian. I didn't want to compete with Brian because our field was so niche anyway. So what I decided to do was start a online portal that would do nothing but show videos and music all day. So now, Everybody's doing some kind of online streaming service. But that to my beat.com was the original streaming service that we started. That was 06, 07. And as a result of starting to my beat.com, I needed a way to market to my beat.com. And at the time, radio was still king. And uh, I knew that if we could get on the radio and call it the to my beat.com show, we could market the website right? because that was what we were really trying to do was market the website website and uh i wrote a proposal and we went and met with people at inner city broadcasting and emis at the time and we made some headway we had opportunity to work with emis originally and we were able to work with uh, cd 101 before they went off the air and uh, we actually had Stephanie Cook do Har Harlem Week with CD101. Uh, she remembers. She'll tell you. Anyway, I took the same proposal to BLS. And at the time, BLS was going through a transition. Vinnie Brown was leaving. And a new head of uh, PD was coming in. And uh, met them through uh, oh God, Uncle Ralph. He actually took me to meet the heads of BLS, and, uh, gave them my proposal, didn't hear anything from them. They never got back to me. Now, the proposal for ToMyBeat.com was written to be a radio show that was going to marry Neo Soul to Soulful House. On this particular kind of show, I wanted to play Neo Soul and Soulful House because Neo was getting some radio play. But I figured Neo Soul and Soulful House are like cousins. They kind of very similar in music. So I wanted to put those two together. That was what To My Beat.com show was going to be. And the To My Beat.com online portal was going to stream video from Neo Soul and House Music. That's what it was doing when we had built it. And uh, it was on 24 hours of the day, just streaming music. Anyway, time went on, and nobody ever called me back from BLS with the proposal. Well, that, that, what, three years later, finally, I get a phone call from someone at BLS, and they leave me a message on my phone, say, hi, this is Brown, and I'm calling from WBLS. We're very interested in having you work with us on the show. After three years, we waited, and uh, at that time, I had the phone to my dot com. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I was actually going to give it to Spinner and his mom. But I realized in order to continue with to my dot com, you would have had to make it a couple of dollars. And I didn't want to put that burden on anyone. Anyway. So uh, finally they called, BLS called, and said, 
left his name, left his message. I never called him back. Two months go by, he calls again. A week go by, he calls again. I never call him back. Why did you call him? Because I, was, I didn't believe it. And I was moving on at that time to a different part of my life. I was actually, West End was gone. I wasn't working like I was working there. And uh, then finally, Marley Marl called me, who I had worked with when I was running West End. That's how I knew West Marley Marl. He called me, hey, listen, man, I'm up here, and they're very interested in working with you. They asked me, did I know you? And I told them yes, and they wanted me. I'm like, okay, Marley. And I really just nonchalant to it. Didn't bother about calling him again. So finally, Molly called me with Brown in the room. And they both got on the phone, and I, I'm like, okay. So Brown said, we really like your proposal, and we're very interested in working with you. By then, I didn't have ToMyBeat.com. And by then, I didn't know what we were going to do with Blades. So I needed a way to monetize a radio show. If I was going to do a radio show. I was never used to being Kevin Head out front. Uh, that wasn't my thing. And uh, so being that I didn't have a base and I didn't have to my beat.com, what was I going to do? Well, I was always working at for the party. And I figured, wow, this is perfect. I can monetize the radio show through letting it promote the party. And that's what we did. So it became a partnership, the same partnership that's in the club, but to the radio. And working with Louis was perfect. It was a perfect marriage. And uh, finally when they called me, I went to meet with Skip Dewitt, who is the everything man at BLS. He's the boss <laughs> at BLS. And he told me what he wanted to do. My only thing was I didn't want to be in the overnight. I felt like house music shows had traditionally been put in on radio. On, you know, if it made it to terrestrial radio, it was coming on at one in the morning. And that was something that I wasn't interested in because I felt like it wasn't going to help move the genre anyway. If it was coming on at one in the morning, I was in the <laughs> Or I was in the club. So we went back and forth about the starting time. And I said, I'm not interested if you're going to put me on at midnight. Finally, they agreed to let me start at 11. I said, okay, I'll take that. So, went back, I told Lou. Lou was like, great. Lou was gung-ho for it. So, we started the first thing twice at BLS. We came on from 11 to 1. And then, someone came in and wanted to buy the 11 to midnight slot. They want to uh, buy that to promote their club and at that time they were going to pay a certain amount of money to BLS to own that hour and then BLS was still going to be able to run their ads so I couldn't compete with that so Skip came to me he said look we really like this show uh, it was 11 to midnight spot so we're going to have to ask you to move to move where he said, well, we're going to put you back to 12. I said, when I first came here, I didn't want to be on that 12. I'm not interested in that. So he says, well, Kevin, there's nothing we can do. You know, we really have to sell a spot because the, the muckety mucks, the right. suits, mm -hmm. want the show. They want that money. I said, all right, I'll tell you what. Because I've seen this show, I've seen clubs buy radio time, and it does work. You know, you live broadcast from a club doesn't mean people are going to come to the club. Right. So, when this doesn't work, Skip, I don't want to come on at 11. I want to go from 10. So, they put that show on. Within three weeks, it was off. So, Skip said, hey, look, we want you to go back to 11 because they're not going to be there anymore. And I said, no, that wasn't the deal. I want to go back to, if we're going to go, I want to go back on that prime time. I want to house music to have a prime time slot. But the difference in the slots is that radio really don't count from 11 to 6 a.m. They really only count from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. 
so, um, because it's prime time, that's when the advertisers want to be on. People are up. People are up. Okay? Yeah. So, uh, he said, well, I might not be able to do that for you, Kev. He said, you know, um, you know we, we, we don't know. But they were still unsure of how to live time. I was on So I said, I'll tell you what. If you don't put me back on, there's no need for to come By that time, we had a relationship with them. And Skip says, just go back on at 11, and I'll see what I can Spoke to Louie, Louie said, yeah, let's do it. We went back on at 11, and in two weeks, he put us on at 10. And we've been on 10 at 10 for eight years now. So it is the only house music show in time anywhere in the world. Probably. And it's right here in New York City. So New York City and the surrounding region should really be proud of themselves for that. Um, Brooklyn is the largest demographic for BLS. The second largest demographic for BLS is Texas County. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's right. So there you go. Word. And, uh, and, you know, I grew up on BLS. So this is like a dream. I don't know if it's, I never dreamed myself being on the radio. I wanted to be Larry Devan. So I didn't care about the radio. Anyway, when we got the opportunity, I saw it as an opportunity to push house music. It was coming at a time when dance music itself was being accepted in pop with EDM. And I felt like we had the opportunity to move dance music even further into what they call urban adult contemporary. That's what BLS station is. We started out with two urban contemporary stations, BLS and Kiss. Now we have one. And uh, that's a little bit of a bit of a story. And so a lot of the show is programmed in terms of I especially since my my time of the show was on in prime time I'm trying to make sure that we keep our ratings and our spikes at a certain level to keep us on the air because we have to draw a certain listenership a certain amount of people and that's what keeps us on the air so at any level of art if you're going to be competitive I mean you're going to work in a competitive cycle you're going to have to do business and that's what I love. I love every aspect of the art and the business. <laughs> nice. So now you guys know it wasn't a, oh, that's Kevin Harris. Let's just put him on the radio. No, it never was that. It that was, was three work. years. Three years of and work. he ignored their calls <laughs> largely for the most part, which I'm sure piqued their interest probably a little bit more. But, uh, right, like as soon as you ignore people, that's when they really want to do something with me. Um, Oh, that dad, there's a question that I was looking to ask you, but I soapboxed a little bit, and lost the question. Yeah, but, yeah, what is it? Oh, that's Mina. Mina, 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 Mina. Mina, 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 Mina. Yeah, they do the show, they do the show afterwards. Uh, <laughs> what was the... When people like, what was the the zenith, if there were, if there was one, or maybe it hasn't come to you yet? Of do you think was of your friend? The zenith. Mm -hmm. Wow, I never even thought about it, man. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I can't even say. Um, looking back over the times, you know. If I had one time to pick it out, mm -hmm. a real high point for me working in this business mm -hmm. is when we brought Grace Jones to the park. That was something that was amazing that I was actually doing that. Mm -hmm. That we actually brought, we did, it was, see, at the time when I was going, the reason why I wanted to buy West End mm -hmm. was not just because it was a record label and all that stuff. But I wanted to buy West End because I understood that West End controlled the Paradise Garage. Oh. And being that I was Shelter, I thought it would be amazing for Shelter to, to be able to marry Shelter and the Garage. Mm -hmm. 
So that's why I went to buy West End. It really had nothing to do with records or West End being a legendary label. It was more about the fact that West End controlled the Paradise Garage brand. And being that we already had the Shelter relationship, I wanted to the Shelter and the Paradise Garage to be married. And that marriage could live on. I thought it would be amazing to be able to call brand Shelter and Paradise Garage. So that weekend that we brought Grace Jones to Central Park was Gay Pride weekend. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the year. It, no, it had to be 2002, right? And because it was after, yeah, 2002. And we brought her to Central Park, which was crazy. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of work. We had to, we was on 39th Street. We had just had the club renovated. And uh, we were doing some, some crazy things. And uh, bringing Grace, we threw a Paradise Garage party in the middle of Central Park that was put on by Shelter. So that was the marriage. That was the official co-branding of Garage and Shelter. That was the first time. And that was all of us. Me and Mel Sharon and everybody coming together. That was the first time it was going to happen with that party. And we did the party in Central Park. Grace showed up and killed it. And of course, I mean, over time that we worked at Shelter, we brought Grace Jones for a time. She became like a personal friend. Mm -hmm. She became a personal friend along with Matsusui Noble became a friend because every time Grace shows up, you have to get sushi from Noble. So <laughs> Noble has a lot of cash in the pocket for me <laughs> regarding Grace. That and Cristal. Uh, anyway, that was the first party, and that was the co-branding. That was the coming together of Shelter and, and Paradise Club. But that's the reason why I bought West End, was the co-branding with Shelter. So, do you still own that Paradise Garage? Like, no, 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 no. That no, went no, when no, you no. sold the West End. When we got rid of West End, all of that went through. Uh, yeah. Because I see a lot of people with Paradise Garage. All of those are usually fakes. Uh, I mean, it's in public domain now. Oh, people yeah? doing. Been, well, there's no police, you know, nobody owns, when, when I had the trademark and the copyright, we were policing it, but it's a very hard thing to stop people from doing Yeah, very hard thing. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not bring this up. What was the separation? What happened with Blake? What was the end of Blake? I don't think it ever ended. I think, um, I think, how can I explain this? I think when I was doing my thing with the business, and I think Josh wanted to do his thing. And uh, I think that is, that is basically, we just kind of went in different directions mentally. That often happens. Um, I was becoming more and more of a businessman than I was actually living in the studio. And Josh loves the studio. He's a uh, musician and an artist. He loves that. I did not want to never go back to the studio. The plan was to do a Blaze album with him. But I, I think along the way, things got cloudy. And uh, me and him had major misunderstandings over business. And uh, and then I think he just wanted to grow and do, and he's doing fantastic with his honeycomb records. I'm impressed with his ability to do his label. He's doing it differently than I would do, which I like. Mm -hmm. See, he's doing it with the vibe of his family and his love, and I and I and I believe in that. What I come to learn about business is that his family and love up until the business. Up until this business, mm -hmm. then family and love is not strong anymore. Right. So, when you're the guy that's making the decisions, sometimes you have to make decisions that are difficult. Definitely. And in difficult decisions, you're not going to be like a lot. And I've had to make some difficult decisions. See, you know, we started this thing when I was 17 years old. That's when our first records came out of Blake. 
we've been recording since then. And uh, ever since that age, I have been, when you start out in the music business, you're very young and you're put into adult situations. When you're at 17 years old, you're signing contracts. And signing contracts is definitely, definitely an adult situation. But at 17, you don't know much about adult situations and business like that. So you do it because of what has to be done. And over the years, I happen to be the guy that is in the position to make those decisions. So I've had to make some tough decisions that weren't popular. And even some of my di decisions over the years probably weren't popular with Josh at the end. He, need, he wanted to make his own decisions. And I'm happy he's getting to do it. And he's learning some valuable lessons about what it takes to do this. Made success. There's times when I don't eat. Um, there's times when I had to make a decision between whether I'm gonna go to the studio or I'm gonna get a, a sandwich. Uh, one time Josh and I took a trip to the West Coast to meet with Motown about the next Blaze album and they would drop us. So we went out there flat broke and we ate donuts for breakfast because that's all we could afford and we bought a half a pizza for dinner for the five days we up there. That's what we ate every day because we couldn't afford to buy anything else. And then to top it all off when we flew back home from LA to Newark, there was nobody there to pick up at the airport. So we walked from Newark Airport to Beth Israel Hospital, because that's where we were living in that area to get on. So there's a major sacrifice in the music and that's why a lot of people can't get to a certain level. At times, a lot of some guys will remember Eastern Art Courting Studio. And most won't because it was recording studio years ago in East Carthage. It was over by where Upsala College was. But there's been plenty of nights that I had to walk from there to Beth Israel Hospital to get home because that's the job. I mean, literally, physically walk. I mean, I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. Different. Uh, or I was but it, 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 even still to the day, DJs will see, they see the heads, they see Louis Vega, they see the lights, they see the glam. But Louis and I still do gigs for free. I was telling him, he was like, I'll never do gigs for free. Okay. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I still do gigs for free. I still will go and going to do a benefit for this particular thing here. I'm doing it for free. Um, I don't do business with my friends. I do favors. So my friends can never pay me to come play at their party. They can never do that. Or stand for that. So what I'm saying is that there's a sacrifice that they make. Which now even with my son, you know, you see, I've been sacrificed. Anything you want, you're going to sacrifice. And uh, that's what the labor of love is all about. So I love every aspect of it. And it's a roller coaster. I have great years, and then I have terrible years. Um, that's always been, been that way since the beginning, since I've been in the music business. Or in any kind of business, it's been that way. Yeah. So I learned to have multiple businesses. So to have it. Some when some, some doing bad, the other one's doing good. That's that's what I learned to do. And we've had you know and then when you're in the music business as a recording artist, you you in about five businesses at the same time. I'm I'm not gonna do all that tonight because that'd be very long. Uh, okay. And then to be successful at business, I usually say it's four things that you really need to understand. You really need to understand the product. You need to understand the audience that the product is for. You need to understand how to reach that audience. And you need to understand how the audience use the product. If 
you really have a handle on those four things, you got this. Last part, question. Just so that people get what it, what they're getting. When you give somebody advice for that, you and I were talking about this before. That's based on what they're, what the, the product that they're getting. And some people don't understand that they're coming. What, what do you mean when I give somebody a price to play? Like, they're going to get the promotion on the LA. Well, yeah. I know what you're saying. That. Yeah. yeah. Well, Louis and I is different rates. You know, and that doesn't mean that I'm the best DJ. That's why the rate is... The rate is not that much because I'm a better DJ. There's, there's guys in their basement and bedroom right now killing me. Right now. However, what I can do for your party other DJs because I can promote and market the party in ways that they never can because I'm lucky enough to be blessed enough to have that for the radio show and it was sacrificed to do the radio show me and Louie don't get paid a lot to do that radio show. like if you listen in the beginning the reason why I use Roots NYC is that was the way to monetize the radio show because you don't get paid a lot to be on the radio not me maybe Steve Harvey does <laughs> but not me. <laughs> they don't pay me that much. You get a listenership like Steve Yardy. Or if people start buying more ads. And that's one thing I'm proud of. When we started on the radio, we had four minutes of commercial. Now we have over 12 minutes of commercial in our time slot. So New York and the people that support the show, you need to give yourselves a round of applause. Because that's not because of what me and Louie do. Don't even tell me that you're going to get me even more nervous. Okay. So what is it? This is your message to the world. I don't have Kevin a message Hens. to the world. <laughs> I don't have a message to I tell you, I don't even know what I want to do now. So there is no message. You know, I will say this. If... Put, make sure that you're always around good people. That's the most important thing in life. Who you surround yourself with. Absolutely. That is the most important thing. In life. It's going to dictate to you where you're going and how you're going to get there. That's it. That's what's up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank fun. you very much. Thank you, thank very you much man. For this coming. Is, I'm nervous, <laughs> you guys. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters, Mr. Kevin Head. Much love and appreciation to him. I thank you for coming. No, this is wonderful to get back to the house. No, he's doing it. The The lights are on. Word. The word. Blessing. The word. Uh, you guys, don't forget to check out Club Elevation. I will be there tomorrow night for the Baby Powder Party with DJ Punch. And next Saturday, February 9th, is the 12th anniversary for Humble Beginnings. 30 Maple Avenue in Montclair, New Jersey. You do not want to miss this. 12 year celebration. You really do not want to miss this. It. It's going to be absolutely bananas. So uh, make sure that you have that in your calendar so that you can come and party with us. That's what we do. All right. So uh, much love and appreciation. Shout out to Tanya Champagne. We are in the champagne room right about now. Big up to uh, Mina Black and Tanya Champagne. This show is coming up next. So don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Like go to the bathroom and come right back because. They're going to be coming up next. So remember, um, the harder you fall, the higher you bounce. Remember that when you trip it. I'm Devious and Mod. This is Devious Fridays, and we are out of here. Peace.